Hello everyone. You're looking at a two foot square tile um, that I play war games on and it's going to serve as the backdrop uh, for this video because what I want to do is produce a video that you can listen to in the background or paint your war gaming figures to and uh, the visual side of it isn't going to be so important but what I'm going what I'm going to do is place on this tile a number of props that uh, I've lined up and I've got ready that are going to form uh, the the hints for the structure of what I'm going to talk about so um, although you may not think it I have actually been doing a lot of painting recently I just haven't finished anything um, or not that much anyway and so I haven't been putting up that many that many videos and another problem I have is that uh, I my videos do tend to be quite long and I'm not bothered by that in that they're the kind of videos that I enjoy watching on YouTube as well but I have got a, such a terrible internet connection that um, it's a major project uploading some of these videos to YouTube. Um, the last one I put up on uh, the coastline between Stoke Point and St Anchorite Rock took something like two and a half days to upload just for a, a 15 minute video. Um, but anyway, that's beside the point. So while I've been painting, I have actually been um, listening to a lot of vid YouTube videos um, that are specifically designed like this one to paint along to. Um, paint and chats and just chats <laughs> in general. Um, it's made me wonder really what um, what I want out of YouTube and what I want to put into it. Um, I, I, I admit I am at the upper end of the sort of age demographic as far as I can tell. Um, so this may be a generational thing, I don't know, it may just be me. But I'm not the kind of person um, that passes the time, um, how should we say, kind of idly. Um, I don't enjoy listening to the radio. Um, I find it a, a kind of an annoyance, especially the sort of chatty DJs um, who just drivel on in between playing tracks. And I don't, I watch a lot of television, but I rarely sit down and watch television as is. I'm, I'm constantly recording programmes and watching them after the event, after they've been broadcast. And the same goes for the radio, that apart from listening to the news briefly in the evenings, I usually listen to the radio uh, via the BBC iPlayer or something like that, listen to complete programmes, and I don't listen to um, just sort of general backdrop radio, as it were. And I'm beginning to find now that I, I'm adopting the same attitude to YouTube, that um, it's all very well to sit down and intend to spend an hour or so painting figures and think to yourself, I know, I'll put so-and-so on in the back background and listen to that. Um, but I'm beginning to get a bit frustrated that I'm not spending the time that time constructively. I'm, I'm getting my figures painted, but I'm not actually um, enhancing my mind in any way while I'm listening to these people. They're, they're perfectly fine, perfectly good uh, YouTube channels, perfectly well presented, but I want things to be a little bit more condensed somehow, and a little bit more um, structured and there is just one 
and only one uh, channel that um, I find suits me in that respect and that is um, a channel that you're probably aware of called Heresy Productions um, that's um, put out by a, a person called Palmer uh, who lives in Canada and it, his subject matter isn't necessarily um, in line with my own particular interests but the way he produces, the way he presents his videos is very structured, um, well informed, and doesn't ramble, doesn't uh, digress, doesn't have a lot of awkward silences and pauses and that kind of thing. He knows what he wants to talk about before he begins. He tells you what he's going to talk about, and then he talks about it. Um, so it's all kind of excellent presentation. And in particular, he has a weekly, or it's usually weekly, uh, video called Heresy Hump Day, where he'll talk for about an hour, maybe less, on a subject, or several topics. Um, but he's got them, he's got it all queued up already, which is what I'm going to try and produce now um, in front of you, with all my props that I have put in order so hopefully it'll keep me on track and uh, I won't digress too much so that's what this that's what this video is all about and um, let me know whether you find it interesting to have on in the background or not okay so as I say I have been doing quite a lot of painting recently um, one of the things that uh, has really got me kind of uh, enthused recently is this set of awards called Soldiers of God, which um, I did put up a kind of brief, uh, no, well, not that brief, um, battle report and explanation of how the rules work and so on recently. Um, it's a set of rules that are designed specifically for the Crusades period. Um, someone did ask me, Nick, um, I think his name's Nick, Medieval Warrior, did ask me whether he thought I the, the rules whether I thought the rules could be transferred to other medieval periods. And there's no reason why not, other than that there is a lot of um, reference to uh, specific crusade uh, topics and flavours in this. So you, if you were going to do it, you could certainly lift the mechanism of the game and uh, take, it, take it to another kind of medieval period. But... Um, you would have to really redesign the cards and so on that come that you play with. But anyway, in in um, this book, there are rules for siege sieges, and I remembered. I'm I, I'm I'm sort of mainly painting Crimean war figures at the moment, but I I'm dipping in and out of my lead pile and um, painting other little things on the side just to distract me a little bit and. Um, whittle down my lead mountain and I remembered that I had two siege engines that I hadn't got round to putting together and painted painting um, that I've had donkey's years probably well in excess of 20 years I would say probably more like 25 to 30 so here they are um, I got them out um, put them together. They, I can't remember how many pieces they come in now. I think it's about 13. Um, they're from a company called Irregular Miniatures, who are a long-standing company um, who have who exist up in York. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in a moment about uh, Irregular Miniatures in general and compare them to other ranges and so on. Um, but just to show you that... Uh, these trebuchets, you get one in a pack, so I had two packs. The code is 25 stroke 40, and they do come with a kind of uh, fairly clear explanation of how to, how to construct it all. Um, I had to kind of source my own cotton, um, wasn't quite sure how to, uh, to rope it all together. Um, but I use some, again, from my 
surplus of uh, modelling supplies and things that I've still got lying around, some rigging rope for modelling um, ships, not the 1 1200th scale ones, but uh, larger models. Um, so I used some of that and stained it, and it looks quite good as, as the rope, I think. Um, so there we go, I had those two done and dusted now that uh, I will eventually be able to use in um, siege sieges when I get round to uh, building some walls and so on for the crusade period but um, while I was in that particular box of uh, my unpainted lead that I got I also um, picked out a pack of eight figures, again by regular miniatures, um, which are um, a kind of, I don't know how you describe them really, they're, they're, they're eight figures that are all suitable to place alongside siege machines, that kind of thing, and they are all in what's described as Eastern dress, so they do a similar pack um, for the Western, uh, whatever the Western style is, so European, I suppose, medieval European. Um, now, I haven't painted these figures terribly well, and I painted them very quickly because if I didn't paint them now, alongside those trebuchet that I painted, quite frankly, I will never paint them. They're not, they're not figures that I particularly admire. Um, I have an absolute mountain of unpainted figures. And as I say, if I, did, if I didn't paint them now, they would never get painted. Um, irregular figures, irregular, if you're not familiar with them, are really, really strange, I think. Um, let's try and bring them a little bit closer to you. They don't really... Um, I'm not trying to be disparaging about Irregular, but they don't really warrant a great deal of attention. Um, the detail on them is very um, rough and the sculpts themselves are really crude. I think crude is the best way of describing them. Um, to the extent that some of the figures have are almost um, gargoyle-like. I mean, this chap's face. I haven't bothered to paint eyes or lips or anything like that. Because if you do, it just seems to accentuate the the grotesque features that they have. They barely, some of them barely look human. Um, there's one particular one here uh, that, that is more kind of, that is very Eastern, far Eastern I would say, probably Chinese maybe, and he's kneeling with a, a bolt in his, uh, his hand, obviously directing some kind of bolt thrower, maybe his Mongol, I don't know. Um, he won't really do for the for my trebuchets and uh, the crusade period, but that's the kind of thing that's the kind of thing you get in um, packs of irregular figures. Now, having said all that, I have a really soft a real a real soft spot for irregular miniatures. They have been around a long time, and they have really suited my purposes, my wargaming needs, um, a great deal over the over the years. Um, and yet, the figures themselves are are really some of them are really substandard. It's very hard to make out what some details are on them. They don't look normal. <laughs> um, but from a distance, those are per those are eight perfectly good wargaming figures. Um, splash a bit of paint on them, put them on your wargaming table, and away you go. 
And another thing about Irregular is that they have an absolutely enormous range in, in all kinds of scales. Um, so I'm often, I often go to them to find things that other ranges just don't do. I mean, these the trebuchets themselves are a case in point because there aren't. I know Old Glory do some. I've, I've found some that Old Glory do, um, but things like limbers, lots of ranges don't have artillery limbers. Irregular do limber after limber after limber for all kinds of periods. They do all sorts of artillery pieces. Um, a long time ago, I mean back in the late 70s and early 80s, I got very interested in the Mongol period. And there weren't that, at that time, there weren't that many companies around who produced Mongols. So I ended up painting an army of these chaps. Um, these are some of my Mongol figures from my Mongol. I painted a long time ago, so I apologise for the quality of the painting. Um, but I found that Irregular not only suited my my needs um, but it, they also the figures having said that they're fairly grotesque and odd I found that these Mongol figures in particular matched my idea of what Mongols look like now part of that was that I have a very kind of firm, fixed opinion on what the Mongol armies that invaded Europe looked like and, um, and were equipped with and so on. And a lot of ranges just don't, don't fit into my idea, my perspective of what the Mongol army appearance was. Um, the main thing, the, the biggest thing, but not the only thing, is that the Mongols rode ponies, um, particularly in the early um, years of the first uh, Mongol incursions into China and into the uh, Middle East, and then the, the big forays um, that Subadai and people like that led into the uh, Russian steppes and the and Eastern Europe. They were mounted on ponies and I'm, I am fixed in that opinion. I may be wrong in that opinion but I'm absolutely firmly entrenched into that belief and no amount of argument is ever going to persuade me out of it now. I mean, if you, if you, even to this day, if you look at modern documentary footage of um, the Mongols and Mongolia, they are all riding these small ponies. I forget the name of them. They are a particular, it begins with an F, I forget the name. Um, but they're a particular breed of pony, which is particularly um, suited to the to Mongolia. Um, it has some kind of trait in its blood that um, makes it a lot more resistant to mosquito bite and insect bite and that kind of thing as well. It's a very hardy, sturdy pony and as far as I'm concerned this is what the Mongol ho hordes rode when they went south into China and, and west into the uh, Khwarezmian Empire and so to into Persia and into into Russia. Um, now, why is it that I am of that opinion? Well, it's partly because um, I I I I am persuaded of something 
and then if it matches everything and fits in, dovetails with all my other opinions, then I stick with it. And one of my early sources for um, Mongol armies, um, not a good quality, but not not necessarily a, a completely academically accurate series of books, but you will be familiar with them is the Osprey books. And um, the way the, the way the Mongols themselves, their dress and so on is portrayed in here is how I how I formed my opinion of what the Mongol armies look like. Um, so for instance I've even tried to paint that guy there, like the guy on the front cover. Um, irregular are clearly strongly influenced by this this book, this particular um, edition. Uh, for instance, there's an illustration there of a Mongol leading two captives. Um, he's obviously taken back to the uh, Mongol encampment because there's yurts and so on in the background, children playing. Um, but the captives themselves are in Middle Eastern dress with turbans and so on. And um, there's an irregular figure here. Um, the figure at the front isn't irregular, by the way. I'm going to come on to that in a moment. Um, but I think you can see there, that chap there. He's a, he's a straightforward copy with these two captives in the back of that particular illustration. Um, I could give you other examples. Irregular also do. Um, they do a figure which is exactly like that uh, guy holding the, uh, the hunting bird um, and so on. They have got a massive range of Mongols. Um, I made a little camp for Field of Glory using some of their yurts and uh, some of their um, the civilians and a guy sat down at the, at the fire in his armour and so on. But there's no mistaking it, all these figures very clearly influenced by Osprey and because I am very clearly influenced by Osprey as well, um, then Irregular just seemed to dovetail into my um, taste, really, which is why I've got so many of them. Um, now, as I say, I am fixed in that opinion, but a lot of people will argue that uh, Mongols rode larger ponies and so on, and a lot of rangers you will find um, do do portray the Mongols on on sturdier mounts, as it were. Um, to me, they don't look right. But there are other companies that produce, um, or did produce, I should say, um, accurate-looking horses and so on. But they just seem to go out of out of production. I haven't got a clue why. Um, it's odd. What is it that keeps irregular going when their figures aren't the best sculpts? When other other ranges just go under. Now the guy, the figure at the front there. I've I've even forgotten the name of the range. But they don't exist any longer. I, it was it was some it was either QT I think it might have been QT or IT miniatures something T miniatures. Um, really nice figure I think. And another th another figure that they produced was again something that absolutely fitted into my notion of what a Mongol army should look like is this figure here, which is um, a stuffed straw scarecrow stroke sort of dummy mounted onto a horse, or a pony, I should say, pony, 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 
um, which was a favourite tactic of the Mongols. They would they would make their armies um, appear larger by mounting lots of um, stuffed straw dummies on the ponies that they took with them. They would they would ride one pony, but often have four others in trail, um, and they would deliberately tie branches and twigs and so on to the tails of these ponies to kick up more dust and um, put these put these uh, sort of mannequins or whatever you'd like to call them dummies onto the horses to make it appear that there were riders on them as well. Um, meanwhile often their main force would deliberately um, conceal themselves and make huge flanking marches and so on and um, they would deliberately kind of uh, conceal their traces and try not to make their presence known. Um, and this range, as I say, I've got three of these, and I used to use them, I've got them based singly, because I used to use them as ambush markers in um, Field of Glory, uh, which I don't play anymore. I was never that keen on it. Um, but now you can't get these. You can't get these. I don't know of a, I don't know of another range. Not even irregular, which, as I said, I think one of the principal reasons irregular has survived is the extent of their range. Um, but they don't. They they don't do them either. Um, another company that's still around, but her, and used to have a really good range of Mongol figures, but seem to have dropped the Mongols from their catalogue, is Steve Barber, model, Models. Um, and his figures are on... Um, his, his horse figures are, are kind of pony-like. So they, they suited my purposes as well. But I, I have, the, one of the reasons why I have a massive lead mountain is that I am constantly in fear of ranges that I like. Um, disappearing, going out of uh, production. So I tend to buy things when they're available and store them. Um, and I found these actually. Uh, I got a big shoebox full of unpainted figures at a bring and buy at the uh, local Plymouth show a long time ago. Um, and I've had them unpainted ever since. But I don't regret having bought them because um, now, you know, you can't get these figures. Whereas... There are other ranges such as Old Glory that I have a lot of. Um, that are still going strong. But good as Old Glory figures are, I mean they're kind of middle range in terms of quality. They, they, they go for kind of bulk um, packaging, lots of figures in one pack. Um, Quite good, quite good figures, quite good sculpts, but not not of the quality of a of ranges such as Perry or Foundry or Front Rank, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, Old Glory still going strong. Now, Old Glory don't suit me at all, really, even though I've got a lot of them, because I find that they are not um, the figures aren't portrayed in what I regard as a historical fashion. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about that, but what I'm going to do is just interrupt this video for a second, um, because my camera, once it gets to 30 minutes, it will carry on recording, but there's often a kind of uh, interruption in with the dialogue, as it were. So I'm just going to stop at 29 minutes and then start again immediately. Okay, back again. So other than me, Telling you about it, you probably won't even notice an interruption. Right, so I've got, I have a lot of these figures. Um, again, most of them unpainted. They are from a range called the Mongols in Europe. So, one would expect that the figures would um, be specifically for that theatre. But it, I'm never taking these out of the pack, but if you look, I um, don't know whether you're even going to be able to see, so I'm sorry, apologies for 
but I don't really want to open them. You'll have to take my word for it. But they are all um, figures with wicker shields with um, the Korean auxiliary dress, which is um, this appearance here. Okay, so they have they have these shields and this kind of metal helmet with a kind of uh, fabric um, back to it and this quilted clothing. Um, again, I'll try and show you that, but I don't think you're going to make that too well in the glare. Um, now, this is an accurate portrayal of what a uh, Korean auxiliary looks like, but this is this, but this basic um, appearance is taken from something uh, called the Hakata Invasion Scroll, which is a Japanese um, scroll, a bit like the Bayo Tapestry, which um, this is this is a mug I have here. Um, which shows you a little bit of the Bayo Tapestry. And I've got this out for a topic that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But the Hakata Invasion Scroll is a very similar kind of um, uh, artefact to the Bayo Tapestry. Um, it depicts the attempt by Kublai Khan to land an invasion army on the shores of um, Japan at a place called Hakata, which is on the island of uh, Kyushu, I think it's called, down in southern Japan. And, I mean, it's well known that Kublai Khan, he made, he made two attempts, both invasions failed, and the second invasion um, failed because of the, the divine win, the kamikaze which is what the suicide pilots of the Second World War were named after. Um, but, as far as I'm concerned, no way did Korean auxiliaries at attend the Mongol invasions of Europe um, uh, as, also in my fixed opinion, which might be wrong. No way did the Mongols ride horses all the way from Mongolia to um, to Europe, and yet the Old Glory Range has all their mounted figures on really heavy mounts. Um, there are no ponies really to speak of portrayed in their range. Um, so what I want to talk about next. And I am, again, I have very fixed opinions on this and absolutely little or no um, knowledge to back it up, little or no specific um, detailed study of it um, to argue my case. But there is a big d difference in what a pony is capable of doing and a horse is capable of doing. Um, ponies are ideal um, mounts for a number of reasons. One is um, that they are much easier to ride. Um, horses can walk, they can trot, they can canter and they can gallop. But a pony can do something else as well, which is it can amble. Now, if you are riding a pony and it is ambling, you can stay on it for hours on end. Um, it's a really comfortable. I've never done it. I'm, I, this is all um, gleaned from TV documentaries and books and so on. Um, but it, but it will keep you. It will keep you comfortable, and you can travel huge distances without having to get off your pony. Um, Whereas if you're riding a horse, you're bounced around, you get saddle sore really quickly. Um, you can't travel from Mongolia to Europe 
on a horse very quickly, as well as the horse's nutritional needs are, are different. A pony can graze um, terrain that's less suitable for horses. Um, so, so, so the Mongols really, um, I don't believe, took horses with them to Europe. I'm not saying that they didn't, that their heavy cavalry wasn't eventually, didn't, they didn't acquire um, horses as time went by, but it's not, it's not my notion of what a Mongol army looked like. And they certainly didn't have Korean figures in their army when they um, invaded Poland and Russia and so on. Um, I was going to say something else about ponies, but I've, yeah, it's, it will come back to me in a moment. But I mentioned the Bayo Tapestry a moment ago. Let's get my drinking mug out again. Um, I am now going to contend that ponies were a lot more prevalent at the time of the Norman invasion of England as well than a lot of war gamers actually believe or war game with. So here are a couple of my mounted Normans. Um, these figures are war games foundry. Um, very large, I think you can see there, very large horses, almost, they've almost got an appearance of a kind of shire horse. So these are the sort of horses that um, you would expect to see a knight, a medieval knight riding. Not, um, they're not ponies at all. Um, I, I was at uh, the local war games club once and um, I'm, I'm, I like these figures and uh, I was quite pleased to be complimented on them by um, one of the uh, members of the club who does have a very good background uh, knowledge of lots of historical matters. Um, but like me, he's also got very fixed opinions and I found that our opinions differed to the point where we nearly fell out um, on this subject. Um, because I said to him, yeah, they are good figures, but I don't think they're terribly accurate historically. Because I'm, I don't think the Normans rode horses of this size, especially um, during the invasion. And the reasons I give for that are many. Um, the Normans were um, descendants, as it were, of the Northmen, of the Vikings. And some Viking armies that came to, came to England and stayed, overwintered, and caused the Anglo-Saxons such problems, um, did travel around the country on ponies. Um, I would contend that the Normans, um, being descendants of the Vikings, were still in the habit of riding ponies in 1066. They used them as a means of travelling long distances, as I said, an ideal um, employment of the pony. And they used them as, they used them in battle, yes, but they used them to give them a slight height advantage, not to give them the kind of shock effect that a charge of knights in the next kind of couple of centuries mounted on horseback would have. They basically 
were given a slight advantage in terms of height. And don't forget as well that the Vikings were a seagoing. I mean, Viking, I think Viking literally does mean seafarer. These mounts had to be taken by ship to wherever they were going, as was the Norman army that invaded, invaded England in 1066. It was transported by ships that looked almost identical to the Viking... I don't think there's one portrayed on here. To the Viking ships that... Um, that troubled our shores in the, in the centuries prior to 1066. And a pony is a far more compact and uh, compliant animal than a huge steed when you take it onto a, um, a crowded longboat. So another reason why I think they, they wore, they, they rode ponies. Um, about the time I had this, oh, it was turning into an argument with this um, other guy. Um, there was a programme on television, Time Team, and they actually um, were investigating an old Norman Moss and Bailey site. And they found a bridle. And it was quite obvious that the bridle wouldn't have um, suited anything other than a small horse or a pony. Um, and they actually lined up a number of um, local um, horses and ponies. And the pony that they um, picked on as being the size that they thought the Normans would have ridden was literally something, tiny little thing that had, I think the girl who, who owned the, the pony was about 12 or 13, something like that. Um, last little bit of evidence is um, that people have always said that the Bayou Tapestry um, figures are disproportionate and inaccurately um, portrayed. But just look how the knight that's riding this horse, is it a horse, is it a pony, how close his feet come to the ground. Same there. These are ponies, they're not horses. Um, the people who made the Bayeux Tapestry were quite aware of what a knight on horseback would, would have looked like, or what a what a the size of a man was in proportion to um, his mount, and look where the well, look where the feet are on that that figure. And look where they are on the on the mug. Um, So that's really all I want to say about ponies. Um, contentious, maybe, yeah. Um, but I have my opinion, and I can't be arguing out of it now. Which is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. Um, so next, I want to. When moving on, but still on the subject of Normans. Um, this book is probably the most boring history book. I have ever read in my life. Um, it's written by a historian called J.H. Round. It was first published in 1895 and it is very opinionated, um, very written in a very um, dry, oh, difficult to read style. Um, going into immense detail about um, the minutiae of feudal England um, at the time of, in the, uh, basically in the 11th and 12th centuries, um, trying to detail um, exactly what 
and how big various units of land were. Um, he goes into how many virgates there are to a hide and how many acres there are to a virgate and how many bovates there are in a carusa and all kinds of things like that. Um, that's for about the first two thirds of the book and then in the, in the final third he then goes on to um, uh, debate and question uh, other historians, contemporary historians. Um, so in particular he's written an essay here or a short piece on um, Mr Freeman and the Battle of Hastings and Mr Freeman is another historian who was contemporary with J.H. Round and um, he has a big debate um, and takes issue with the fact that um, Freeman was probably the first historian um, or yeah probably the first historian of note since the Victorian period who insisted on calling the Battle of Hastings the Battle of Senlac um, and J.H. Round th thought that particularly pedantic um, and so decided to question the use of the, t the word Senlac and he does so um, using a number of arguments, all of which are perfectly valid. But at the end of the day, this argument between Freeman and Round became quite heated. Um, people's um, the core of their conception of what the Norman period was like was called into question and it became very important to them to um, to establish one way or the other whether it was the Battle of Senlac or the Battle of Hastings and of course no um, no real uh, resolution of that argument to this day but I think I think round one out um, Freeman never really um, it never really became mainstream to refer to the Battle of Hastings as the Battle of Senlac um, but the point I'm trying to make is that um, the issue became one where there was a great deal of heated argument over it um, why is it that we that we we fix our opinions and I'm I'm guilty of this as well as saying I have very fixed opinions now on Mongol ponies and so on um, and I won't I can't be argued out of them now I don't think there is a convincing argument um, against but um, it's it becomes it becomes a really kind of important issue to the point where you get really annoyed with people and can't um, can't even tolerate it's very hard to it's very hard for me to um, compromise and even accept if someone were to put a Mongol army in front of me on a war games table and they were all mounted on huge charges it's very hard for me to even accept accept that um, in the same way that some people won't play against armies that haven't been painted or something like that um, maybe I should uh, lighten up a little bit but the, the final thing I want to talk about to you about is um, I want to go back to these irregular miniatures put a couple of them on the on the table there and put one of these um, Norman knights here as well I think you can see it's not just the fact that one is on a one is on a horse and one is on a pony. Um, there's a big, big difference in uh, the size of those figures. Um, so there's a difference in we would say there is a difference in scale. So I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to refer to as scale creep in the industry. And again, get back to the, the topic of consensus and how much we have to compromise and so on. Um, 
Irregular miniatures now. I, I went to their website recently. Um, refer to all their figures in this particular scale as 28 millimeter. Now these figures are exactly the same figures as they were back when I um, purchased this catalogue, which I'll put the date up here, March 2000, and it's referred to as the Irregular Miniatures 25mm catalogue. So what has happened to persuade Irregular to call these figures 28mm when they are absolutely, to my mind, again, this is my own opinion, out and out 25 millimeter um, scale. What's what on earth is going on with the wargaming industry that wargamers and figure manufacturers can't um, can't agree on what 25 millimeter is, what 28 millimeter is. And why should Irregular change their mind? It's got to be something to do with marketing and so on. That the 25mm 20, is a scale that is kind of almost um, unfashionable now. Um, I, I find it really odd that this, this is one thing that, that you can... You don't. It, it can't be argued about. An inch is an inch. A centimetre is a centimetre. Um, how how is it that every every individual manufacturer seems to have a different definition of what twenty eight millimetre scale is, what twenty five millimetre scale is, um, and and that that as I say isn't a matter of opinion. It's not my opinion that an inch is an inch long. It's an objective fact. Um, we, we can't even agree amongst ourselves whether the, the, the scale should be referring to the height between the foot and the eyes or the foot and the top of the head, whatever. Um, and that is something that I don't think would be that difficult to resolve. But now, because so many um, manufacturers can't redesign their figures, can't rescale them or whatever. Um, it's sort of set in stone in a way. Um, so you have to take each individual manufacturer's definition um, as it is. Um, yeah, that's more or less all the subjects I wanted to talk about and I can see my, uh, my battery is about to run out so I'll stop it there and um, hope you enjoyed uh, painting along to that or whatever you're doing um, let me know what you think and I might do more videos sort of waffly rambling videos like that in the future rather than on a specific topic and thanks for putting up with it and I'll see you on the next video bye for now